We're back with part five of the hands-on big data workshop and I'm Brian Womack, data librarian at Rutgers University. In this section we're going to talk about Hive uh, and compare it to Pig which we just did in the last section. We're going to continue using our Amazon cluster uh, which was set up in section three and run our examples on the Hue uh, web interface to our cluster. So if you haven't set any of that up, you may want to go back and look at the previous uh, videos. But let's talk a little bit more about Hive. So Hive uh, was developed at Facebook, unlike Pig, which was developed at Yahoo. Hive um, is designed to be very similar to SQL, the standard structured query language for access to databases. If you are familiar with, with SQL, you, if you take a look at, say, this cheat sheet, uh, you'll see that the Hive syntax is in many cases identical to straight SQL, and in other cases is only a tiny modification um, difference to straight SQL. So you, in some cases, you may just want to jump in and try your SQL code and then kind of debug it along the way. You may have, it, it's relatively quick to adapt from SQL. Um, and uh, like the other Apache projects, you can get complete documentation on the website, so I would encourage you to take a look there to go further. Um, but we'll show our simple example. And in this case, we're going to go back to our GitHub site. So once again, GitHub slash Ryan data slash big data and we're going to use two files in this case our data file we're going to upload directly this time uh, so you want the WDI extract this is a comma separated file CSV file and very small little uh, sample data set uh, I took a few variables from the world development indicators so that we could have something uh, to something manageable to work with here. And you want to just take that raw data, click on the raw icon, and you can save the link or um, open it up in, a, in an application and save it. And just go ahead and save that to some place you can find it. I saved a copy here to the desktop. And then we're going to upload that into the Hue site. So our Hue browser is still up and running. Um, we go to the file browser and I'm going to put it in the temp directory so I'm going to navigate up to user and then up to the and then into the temp directory the temp directory basically has wide open permissions um, and it kind of simplifies some of the issues uh, you may have with accessing the file just to keep things simple we're going to put it in temp now things do get deleted out of temp uh, fairly quickly, so um, that's something to keep in mind. Um, but I'm just going to drop the CSV file into the temp directory. Uh, then I'm going to go back into the sample code and grab the WDI Hive code. And it's a short program, so I'm just going to copy and paste it over into the Hive query editor. So click on query editors, click on Hive. Um, the editor is is called the beeswax editor in Hive. There's a bee metaphor going on here and I guess if you were allergic to bees you would get hives if you saw all this stuff. Uh, but the developers weren't concerned about that. They went ahead with maximum bee metaphor situation. Um, so a Hive program uh, has a simple SQL type structure. You can insert comments with uh, just two dashes like that. Um, and I was unable to find as a novice user a, a simple method of loading the data directly from S3 on the within a program like we did with Pig. So um, that's part of the reason I'm using the file browser here to upload the data. Uh, you could also, on the command line, execute a Hadoop command to 
pull the data from S3 into the a local user directory. Um, that'll be pretty fast on you know running from one Amazon service to another. Uh, and the syntax for that is in this third line. So you could do that as well. Um, so what is Hive actually doing? We've said the language is like a Q SQL database query. So it is actually taking your unstructured Hadoop data and making it behave like a database. In order to do that, we have to impose the structure on the data. We have to um, specify what we're going to treat as our variables in the data set in the, and, and convert them into um, labeled variables in a database. So we do that by uh, syntax like this. Again, we're going to skim the details. We're not really here to learn the, the language, but just to illustrate how it works, uh, we create a table called WDI and we have to specify the variables that are going to be housed in that table. Uh, we have country, which is a string text value, survival to age 65 for females, uh, that's a numeric value which we represent as an int integer, um, and and so on for the, the variables in the data set. And we also have to tell a little bit about how the data is structured. So these are uh, delimited fields that are delimited by a comma and stored as text, so we have to specify all that. It's not going to read that automatically from some giant data file. We have to specify that up in advance. And the, as in pig, uh, the statement ends with a semicolon. So I'm going to run this little two lines of of code that ends in a semicolon. I hit execute and that ran pretty quickly. Uh, I got a log that shows me some of the steps along the way and reminds me that even though this seems like a simple statement it is running on that cluster and it's, it's going out across the cluster. Um, we didn't get any results printed because we're not asking for output but I can see something happened if I go and refresh my data fit database list over here. I can see uh, now I've got a, a table for WDI. So now I need to load the actual data in. And I do that with a statement like this, load data, give it the path to the data which is in my temp directory, and I'm going to overwrite the data, take the data that's coming in, overwrite it into the WDI table. So I can go ahead and execute those two lines. Once again, we have no results, but as long as we're not getting error messages, we, we should be okay. Uh, this is operating as expected. And now we're actually going to run some queries on the data that we just loaded and structured. So first, a really simple one. Just We're going to select one column, the country column. Highlight that line hit execute and we've got a log and after it's done thinking just for a moment it switches us over to the results tab so in this case we do actually have results printed and we've got um, the country and all the countries in the in the data so that looks like what we'd expect. That's a kind of confirmation that things are working. Um, we can get, you know, simple stuff out of out of the data. Let's do something one step more complicated. The next two lines let us select two variables from the table, and we're going to sort them by the percentage of population that's 65 and older, in descending order. Now this again simple data set. Um, for this particular data set we could do the same things in Excel, but what's important to recognize here is that this is running via the MapReduce methods, as you can kind of see from the logs, um, that it's dividing it into a map stage and a reduce stage, and handling all those operations, and so this could run on 
a huge data set with just the same same syntax. Uh, so here we find out Japan is the country with the highest percentage of 65 and older. Uh, and then we go down the list to countries that have very small 2%, uh, 1% under population over 65. Um, okay, so and then our final example query here, uh, three different parts. We're going to pull three variables. We're only going to uh, select variables where more than 90% of females survive to the age of 65. So that's our where criteria. And then we're going to take that subset and sort it by the population again. So took maybe a couple of seconds longer than the other query, but we still got results. We have, uh, in this case, 26 countries. There, Japan is represented with a zero here, so there are 26 entries um, with more, greater than 90% female survival. And Japan leads the list in terms of aged population. We can see also, though, that some of the countries are, don't have that high of an age pop population but still have very high survival rates. Um, so the important thing to recognize though is that we can take a huge data set, uh, select specific elements from it according to criteria and then you know mix match and sort and display different aspects of that data via standard SQL language. So this is a really uh, nice and straightforward way to work with your data on Hadoop and analyze it. And if you run into trouble and you have to start debugging things and getting into the logs, you'll you'll start to understand that some of the complexity that goes on behind the scenes here uh, in dividing up the task among those multiple machines and the job tracking and stuff. Uh, not quite the same as sorting columns in Excel, but when it works it can produce the same kind of results even off of of big data. Uh, one other nice feature is there is a, a basic charting function built in. So we can get bar charts or pie charts in this case. Uh, it's not going to let us use uh, a map or other things that don't fit this particular data set. Lines would have to have data over time. Um, and the data is not geocoded to anything, so we, we, we can't map it. Um, but again, a nice little extra. Uh, this may not be completely full-featured graphing, but lets us quickly sort of see what's going on with the results. Um, and once again, uh, we can save particular queries. We can also use this explain uh, function to kind of understand a little bit about what is going on behind the scenes. If you want to dig into that, uh, this explain outlines the stages and the way it breaks it up into a map reduce job um, so you can understand what might be breaking or not giving an unexpected result so again our hive editor has given us a lot of functionality in terms of working with these scripts um, it's built into the hue management system so we can use it to manage our jobs if we go over to the job manager job browser we can see those select operations that we just ran are all in the queue and they've succeeded but if something was running for a long time we could see how long it's been running we can kill processes if they we feel like they're taking too long and so this lets you handle things that are running at a at a large scale um, I haven't talked about the Metastore manager but this does um, let you keep track of the data that's been loaded in your system. I'm not really going to go further into that, but um, just recognize that the Hue Editor provides a lot of features. And if you want to see even more features of the Hue Editor, you can go to get, uh, sorry, demo.gethue.com. There's a link in the slides. And this is a publicly accessible website, the demo that's constantly running and uh, has even more editors and data browsers uh, installed so you can experiment with some other things that I haven't talked about in this workshop. Um, 
dashboards to manage your workflows, um, and several built-in examples that you can run off of the demo site to get a feel for how things are are working. Um, so this is a, a sort of permanently available demo site if you don't want to go through and install something. Um, I did one in this workshop to go through the installation on an Amazon cluster so that you have a sense of accomplishment of, of that you can do those things yourself. It's not a mystery. Uh, you just have to go through some some of the details, some of the the, the nitty-gritty steps involved. Um, but the demo.gethue.com site gives you a more full-featured view. So let me end this segment and we're going to when we come back we're going to move on to a discussion of Apache Spark which is a newer project that is getting a lot of attention um, for its performance in this big data space so let's stop here